Tell me, Inspector, have you noticed anything at all peculiar about the state of this room? I wouldn't say peculiar, Mr. Holmes. We found four cigar stubs in the grate. The deceased appears to have been smoking heavily during the night. Hmm. Have you got his cigar holder? No, sir. No sign of one. His cigar case, then? Oh, yes. That was on the dressing table. Here it is. Hmm. Quite so. This is no suicide, Inspector. It's a deliberately planned and cold-blooded murder. The Resident Patient by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dramatised for radio by Peter Ling With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson and featuring Robert Lang as Alfred Blessington Clarence Smith as Dr Percy Trevelyan with David Kossoff and George Winter The Resident Patient It had been a close, rainy day in October. Unhealthy weather. But the evening brought a breeze with it, and Holmes suggested we should refresh ourselves with a ramble to Hyde Park. And what have you decided, Watson? Will there ever be home rule for Ireland? As long as Lord Salisbury remains Prime Minister, it seems to me... I beg your pardon? Well, surely you are musing upon the problem. At a fancy you concluded that such a complicated issue is unlikely to be solved through party politics. Yes, those are my thoughts exactly. I didn't realise I'd put them into words. You did not. Well, we know each other pretty well by now, wouldn't you agree? Hmm? Sometimes I may be able to follow your unspoken thoughts. <laughs> Good Lord. I hope you're not taking up telepathy as a hobby. Oh, <laughs> hardly that. A very unscientific science, I fear. <laughs> very well, then. No doubt you're about to explain to me how the trick was done. My dear fellow, ever since we left Hyde Park, you've been in a brown study, and your features are the faithful servants of your emotions. Do you mean to tell me that you were able to read my train of thought in my facial expression? Mm, your eyes are particularly eloquent. Perhaps you can recall how your reverie began. Yes, I... Well, let's see, I think perhaps... Um... <sighs> no, I can't. Then I will tell you. A barrel organ struck up an old Irish tune. It evoked some picturesque images. Your head was full of the emerald oil. A moment later, a man walked by carrying a travelling bag. Ah, you noticed him too. A Gladstone bag, to be precise. Ireland, Gladstone. You were reminded of his unsuccessful attempt to carry through the Home Rule Bill. Then we passed two dogs barking furiously at each other, and their wretched owners straining to prevent a life-or-death struggle. And at last, far away in Westminster, Big Ben began to strike the hour. Your mind flew to the Houses of Parliament, and a rueful smile quivered upon your lips. Was there, after all, so very much difference in principle between Gladstone and Salisbury hammering it out across the floor of the house and a common garden dogfight? My dear Holmes, you have followed me quite wonderfully. Although, of course, now you have explained it, it's quite obvious, really. Hmm. Certainly, Watson. All very superficial, I assure you. Ah, uh, but it's uh, ten o'clock. High time to turn our steps to Baker Street. Yeah, well, well. It seems we have a visitor. You mean the broom? There's no reason to suppose it's waiting for us. I think you'll find it is. There is a light in the sitting room window. Mrs. Hudson would scarcely have lit the lamp in an empty room. A colleague of yours, perhaps. What makes you say that? I look inside. This carriage belongs to a doctor in general practice, not long established, but he's had a good deal of work already. Of course. The wicker basket. Varied selection of medical instruments, still reasonably new and shiny. Well done, Watson. Well, what brings the good doctor to visit us at such a late hour? Mr. Holmes? Good evening, Doctor. Uh, allow me to introduce you to a fellow medico, my friend Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, please, resume your seat and let me know how I can serve you. Thank you. 
Uh, but firstly, uh, may I ask you how you knew I was a doctor? Uh, uh, my colleague tipped me off. Uh, I'm not alone in possessing deductive powers. Oh, thank you, Holmes. Hmm. Uh, proceed with your story, Doctor. My name is Percy Trevelyan, and I live at 103 Brook Street. Trevelyan? Forgive me, you're not P.J. Trevelyan, the author of a monograph upon obscure nervous lesions. Uh, Dr. Watson, you overwhelm me. I so seldom hear of the work, I thought it was dead and buried. <laughs> My publishers give me a most discouraging account of its sale. But perhaps you are a specialist in that field. Oh, good Lord, no. I'm a retired army surgeon. <laughs> Splendid. Uh, nervous diseases have always been my particular hobby horse. I hope to specialise myself one day. But, well, at first a man has to take whatever offers. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, Mr Holmes. I know how valuable your time must be. The fact is, a, a singular turn of events has occurred in Brook Street. And tonight, matters came to such a head that, well... I decided to come and ask for your advice and assistance. You are very welcome to both. Can you describe these events which have been troubling you? Well, to begin with, I must tell you something of my own circumstances. <laughs> I was a London University man. I hope I'm not being immodest when I say that my student career was considered to be quite outstanding. <laughs> there was a general impression that a promising and golden future lay before me. But there was one great stumbling block. Your future was more... Promising than golden, perhaps. You've hit it exactly, Mr. Holmes. My want of capital. Ah. A doctor who aims high is compelled to start in one of a dozen streets in the Cavendish Square quarter, which entails enormous rents and furnishing expenses, uh, all of them quite beyond my meagre capacities. But suddenly, an unexpected incident opened up new possibilities. I had a visit from a gentleman by the name of Alfred Blessington, a complete stranger to me. He came to my lodgings and plunged straight down to business. Mr Trevelyan? Percy Trevelyan? Why, yes. I, I don't think I've had the, the pleasure... Percy Trevelyan who had such a distinguished career in research and won the Pinkerton Prize for his studies on nervous lesions? <laughs> it's very good of you to say so. Answer me frankly, young man. You'll find it's in your own interest. You have the brains to take you to the top of the tree, but have you got the tact and diplomacy to keep you there? I sincerely hope so. They say practice makes perfect, don't they? Ah, but you don't have a practice, do you? <laughs> so, <laughs> what's holding you back? Oh, at various reasons. I don't think it's advisable to rush things. I prefer to take my time. Poppycock. Come now. Cards on the table, young man. It's the old story, isn't it? More in your brains than in your bank balance, eh? But what would you say if I were to set you up in Brook Street? You mean a practice of my own? Why not? It's just like any other business speculation, and safer than most. I don't quite follow you. What would I have to do? I'll tell you. I've taken a house already. I'll furnish it, pay the staff, and run the whole place. All you have to do is wear out the chair in your consulting room and hand over three quarters of whatever you earn from your patients. You can keep the other quarter as pocket money. And pretty handsome too, eh? <laughs> oh, we bargained and negotiated. I won't weary you with the details, Mr Holmes, but by Lady Day I'd moved in, pretty well on the terms he'd suggested. He continued to live in the house, upstairs in his own apartment. He has a weak heart and needs constant medical supervision. Mm -hmm. You seem to be a very fortunate young man. A West End practice and a resident patient. So I thought. However, since then, Mr Blessington has begun to behave in a very eccentric way. Yes, I'm finding it rather hard to picture your Mr Blessington. What sort of man is he? Physically, he's a very fat man. Though it's apparent that at some time he's been even fatter, for the skin hangs about his face in loose pouches, like the jowls of a bloodhound. And this eccentricity you speak of? He's a man of singular habits, almost a recluse. He shuns company and hardly leaves the house, except to take a short constitutional each evening. He always walks up the road, across Oxford Street, then takes a turn round Cavendish Square and home again. On his return, he calls in at my consulting room to examine the books, gives me five and threepence for every guinea I've earned, and carries the rest off to a strong box upstairs. And I may say he's never had any cause to regret his speculation. From the first, it's been a success. 
Everything was going smoothly until one evening. It was a few weeks ago, September the 13th to be exact. Dr. Trevelyan, doctor, I, uh, I must speak to you. Good heavens, what on earth is the matter? I'm at a, a little shock. Help me to a chair. I must sit down. But, of course, of course. Why, man, you're as white as a sheet. You look as if you'd seen a ghost. It's worse than that. I've just, I've just read something in the evening paper. Oh? Show me. No, no. I don't have it with me. I threw it away as soon as I'd read it. What was it that upset you so much? An item about burglary. Committed last night. Right here in the West End. Villains. A lot of them. They broke into a private house and made off with hundreds, thousands of pounds. Cash, bonds, silverware, jewellery. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible to think such a thing could happen so close to home. I tell you, I shall take precautions at once. First thing tomorrow, I'll have special bolts fixed to the windows. New safety locks on all the doors. But why should anyone want to break in here? They couldn't possibly know about your strong box. The strong box? Aye, the strong box, to be sure. They could have found out about it. These criminals have their ways and means. But if they imagine they're going to break into this house, they're making a big mistake. I'll be too clever for them. You'll see. Oh, yes, much too clever. For a week, he continued in a peculiar state of agitation, peeping out of the window, spying down into the street. He even gave up his daily stroll before dinner. Then, as time passed, he seemed to conquer his fears and renewed his former habits. And then, of course, something else happened. Why, yes. How did you know that? Something must have happened. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here now. <laughs> ah, quite so. But let me try to put things in their proper order. Two days ago, I received this letter by the first post. I brought it with me to show you. In this establishment, Dr. Watson reads the letters. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Holmes listens. Thank you. A Russian nobleman, now resident in England, would be glad to avail himself of the professional assistance of Dr. Trevelyan. He has been for some years a victim of cataleptic attacks, upon which it is well known the doctor is an authority. He proposes to call at about a quarter past six tomorrow evening if Dr. Trevelyan will make it convenient to be at home. And the patient turned up as arranged? I was in my consulting room at the appointed time when the maid showed him in. An elderly man, grey, thin, almost emaciated. He was accompanied by a young man, tall and well-built, with a dark, fierce appearance, though he helped his elderly companion to a chair with surprising tenderness. Count Orlovsky, I am the Mr. Stefan Orlovsky. Thank you, Maria. I will ring if I require anything. Very good, Doctor. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. There, yes. Papa. Are you quite comfortable? Yes, yes. You are not in a draft? No, thank you, my son. This will do very well. Forgive me, Doctor. We cannot take any risks. My father has to be careful at all times. We are both extremely glad to make your acquaintance. I am delighted to meet you. I trust you will excuse my presence here, Doctor, but my father's health is a matter of the utmost importance to me. That's very understandable. Perhaps you'd like to remain here during the consultation? Oh, no, not for the world. It is more painful for me than I can say. If I were to see my father in one of these dreadful seizures, I am convinced I should never survive it. My own nervous system is exceptionally sensitive. <laughs> I understand. My waiting room just across the hall is at your disposal. I am most grateful. I shall be within call if you should need me, Papa. Yes, yeah, you are a good boy, Stefan. Now, sir. As a preliminary, perhaps you would be kind enough to answer a few questions. Of course, of course. I will do my best to tell you as much as I can. We discussed his case history, and I took copious notes. His answers to my questions were frequently very obscure. I, I attributed this to his limited command of English. Suddenly he ceased to speak, and when I looked up, I was shocked to see him sitting bolt upright, staring at me, 
His face a complete blank, his jaws shut tight, his whole body completely rigid. Mm. A cataleptic condition? I was certain of it. Mm. My first reaction was one of pity and horror. But your second, I fancy, was one of professional interest? Well, yes. I must admit, from a professional point of view, it was very gratifying. Oh. I made notes of his pulse and body temperature, tested the rigidity of his muscles and examined his reflexes. Mm -hmm. None of these were particularly abnormal. However, in the past, I had obtained good results in similar cases by the use of nitrate of amyl, ah. inhaled in small doses. Mm -hmm. I had some in my basement laboratory, so I went down to fetch it. When I returned a few minutes later, imagine my amazement upon finding the consulting room empty and my patient gone. And the young man? I ran to the waiting room. Stefan Orlowski had also disappeared. The front door was closed, and I asked Maria, the Spanish maidservant, but she'd heard nothing. She's not been with us very long and is not as efficient as I could wish. Anyway, there was no solution to the mystery. Where was Mr. Blessington during all this? Out on his evening stroll. He came in soon afterwards, but I said nothing to him about the incident. He's a strange man, and quite honestly, I don't take him into my confidence unless it's unavoidable. And you haven't seen or heard of the Russians since then? I certainly didn't expect to. And then, this evening, at exactly the same time, they marched into my consulting room again. Yeah, Doctor, I feel I owe you a great many apologies for my abrupt departure yesterday. Well, I must admit I was very much surprised. The fact is, when I recover from these attacks, my mind is very clouded as to all that has gone before. I woke up in a strange room, or so it seemed, and I found my way out in a dazed condition while you were absent. As to me, seeing my father pass the waiting room, I assumed that the consultation had come to an end. It was not until we reached home that I realized the true state of affairs. <laughs> well, there's no harm done, though I was a good deal puzzled. But now, if you would kindly step into the waiting room, I shall be happy to continue my interrupted consultation with your father. Certainly, Doctor. I will see you presently, Papa. Very well, my son. For half an hour we discussed the old gentleman's symptoms, mm -hmm. and after I prescribed for him, I saw him go off on the arm of his son. Later, when Blessington came in from his constitutional, I heard him go upstairs, and then almost immediately he burst into my consulting room like a man possessed. Where is he? Where has he gone? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand you. The intruder! The burglar! I can assure you there has been no intruder here, Mr. Blessington. Oh, yes, there has. A man has been in my rooms. Who went up to my room? No one. You're making a mistake. Don't lie to me. Please, try to control yourself. I'm telling you, nobody has been upstairs. I'm... Uh, I'm sorry. I spoke hastily. No doubt you believe you're speaking the truth, but how do you account for the footprints on the stair carpet? Come and see for yourself. There! And there! Do you see? It was raining earlier this afternoon. Someone has left muddy footmarks upon the tiles. And on the stair carpet, too! You see? They continue all the way up to my sitting room. Could they be your own prints? You were the last person to come in. For God's sake! Are you blind? Those boots are a good inch and a half longer than mine! Yes. That's true. I demand to know who's been here while I was out of the house. Well, a, a patient called upon me at a quarter past six. Who was it? Did you leave him alone at all? He's a foreign gentleman, Count Orlovsky. But I was with him all the time he was here. Although, now I come to think of it, he did have a son with him. His son? And where was he? In the waiting room, naturally. I can only suppose that during the consultation, the young man must have gone upstairs for some reason. Oh, God! What am I going to do? Do you mean to say the young man has stolen something from your apartment? No, no. Nothing like that. Nothing has been touched. Listen, I need help. You must help me. Do you hear? Just try to keep calm. If nothing is missing, surely it's not such You don't understand! Nobody understands! In God's name, is there no one who can help me? It was then he thought of you, Mr. Holmes. 
I told him he could not possibly trouble such an eminent man, and he broke down and sobbed. He was in such distress. In the end, I had to promise him I would do my best to persuade you to come and investigate this remarkable mystery. Investigate? But since no crime has been committed... It's then... possible that a crime is about to be committed. I fancy that is what terrifies Mr. Blessington. As I say, he's a very eccentric man. But if you'd only come back with me in the broom, then you might at least be able to soothe him and perhaps make some sense out of these extraordinary incidents. Very well. Come, Watson, let us go. Oh, Dr. Trevelyan, I'm so glad you are here. Maria, what's the matter? I saw the carriage drop. I've been so frightened. There, there. there. Uh, come in, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Thank you. Now then, tell me what has happened. It's Mr. Blessington, Doctor. He's upstairs. But he's very upset. He behaves most strangely. In what way, strangely? He has a gun. What? We must go upstairs at once. Stay where you are! <gasps> Good Lord. I have a pistol. I give you my word that I'll fire if you come any nearer. Mr. Blessington, this is quite outrageous. Hey. Is that you, Doctor? I'm sorry. In the half-light, I, I thought for a moment, uh, but those other men with you, who are they? You asked me to bring Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and I've done so. This is Mr. Holmes and his colleague, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Blessington. I'm sorry that we meet under such disagreeable circumstances. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm extremely grateful to you. Please come upstairs. After you, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Thank you. Like an animal at bay, Blessington had retreated to the darkest corner of the landing. Now he relit the gas, and we saw before us a man whose appearance testified to his jangled nerves. Shamefaced, he slipped the pistol back in his pocket and ushered us into his rooms. Come in, Mr. Holmes. Come in, and Dr. Watson. I must apologise for my discourtesy. I'm... I'm very obliged to you for responding so promptly. No man ever needed your advice more than I do. I hope we can assist you in some way. Perhaps if you were to begin by giving us all the facts. The facts are very simple. No doubt Dr Trevelyan will have told you of the unwarrantable intrusion into this apartment. He has indeed, and of the two men who called on him. Are you in any way acquainted with them? Acquainted? No. No, indeed, sir. Why should you suppose such a thing? You have no knowledge of them or why they should pursue you in this way? Well, no. Well, that is... Well, it's very hard to say, isn't it? Didn't Trevelyan explain? I never even met these men, never clapped eyes on them. Yeah, but you have a shrewd idea of their identity. Really, Mr Holmes? You can hardly expect me to answer that question. Yeah, would you be good enough to explain yourself, sir? I'm simply saying, since I never saw them, I can't give you any information about them. That's... Reasonable enough, surely. Uh, very well. Let me put this another way. Do you have any enemies, Mr Blessington? <laughs> Upon my soul! What a thing to say, enemies indeed. Come here, please. This door leads to my bedroom. You see the large box at the foot of my bed? Uh, the strong box? Yes, what of it? I've never been a rich man, Mr Holmes. Never made but one investment in my life, as Dr. Trevelyan will tell you. But I don't believe in bankers. I don't put my trust in banks. Between ourselves, what little I possess is inside that box. Now perhaps you'll understand what it means to me when unknown persons force their way into my rooms. I'm sorry, Mr. Blessington. Sorry? I cannot possibly assist you if you try to deceive me. My dear chap! Well, that's pretty cool, I must say. Deceive you, indeed. I told you everything. Good night, Dr. Trevelyan. Come, Watson. No. Wait. Have you no advice to give me? My advice to you, sir, is to speak the truth. Good night. All the cabs seem to be taken. Uh, Shall we try the rank in Oxford Street? No, uh, no, not yet. Uh, let's sit on this bench and consider the situation. 
Yes, the night air may clear our heads and cool my temper. Uh, you were rather short with that poor wretch. He was in a blue funk. Well, if he'd had the sense to be open with us, I might have been more sympathetic. As it is, I can only apologize, Watson, for bringing you out on a fool's errand. Ah, uh, never mind. You did your best. It's the devil of it. It's the devil, yes. It's an interesting case underneath all that nonsense. Well, I'm glad you think so. Personally, I can't make head and a tail of it. Well, for a start, it's evident that there are two men, well, more than two possibly, but two at least, who are determined to get at this fellow Blessington. Twice the younger man has gained access to Blessington's rooms while his confederate, by an ingenious device, kept the doctor occupied. You mean the two Russians? But the catalepsy... No, I doubt very much if they were Russians, and I'm, I'm fairly certain the cataleptic trance was fraudulent. It was easy enough to imitate. I've done it myself on occasion. Have you? Hmm. Good Lord, when was that? No, that's another story, Watson, and just now I'm engaged upon this one. Yeah. Yes, they're making a dead set at Blessington. No doubt about that. Oh, both times they called, Blessington was out. Yes, but by the merest chance. Their reason for choosing such a late hour for a consultation was to ensure there would be no other patient in the waiting room. They had no idea they'd hit upon the very time Blessington takes his constitutional. But if that's so, why didn't they try to break into the strong box? Well, I don't believe that that was ever their intention. I can read in a man's eye when he's frightened for his life, and Blessington is terrified. I'm certain he knows who those men are, but for some reason he's concealing it. Evening, gentlemen. Huh? Oh, evening. good evening. Good evening, madam. Quiet tonight, isn't it? Mm, quiet, quiet. Very, very pleasant. <laughs> hey, we were enjoying the night air. I know what you mean. Nothing to do and nowhere to go. That's the trouble, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. No, yeah, we were engaged in a discussion, trying to uh, work out the solution to a problem. Oh. oh, yeah. You work at night, do you? Hmm. Yes, we do. We do. Yes, quite frequently. <laughs> ah, forgive me. I, I hope you won't think we're being uncivil. No, no, that's all right. Yeah. I know what it's like when you've got to work. Indeed. Yes. Ta-ta, gentlemen. Ta-ta. Uh, <coughs> good night, madam. <clears throat> I think perhaps it might be as well if we made a move. Really? <laughs> but before we go, hmm? with regard to the solution of the problem, there's one alternative that might not have struck you. Oh, what's that? Ah, has it occurred to you that the entire story of the Russian invalid and his son, whom no one but Trevelyan has ever seen, could be a fabrication invented by Dr. Trevelyan? Has he been investigating Blessington's rooms for some purpose of his own? <sighs> well done, Watson. Yeah. Of course, that was one of the first thoughts that crossed my mind. Oh, was it? Yes, but I was soon able to corroborate the doctor's story. The young man's footprints were still on the stair carpet. Square-toed shoes, not pointed like the doctor's, and an inch and a half longer than Blessington's. Now, I think we may take it that the young intruder exists in reality. Still, so, that was an interesting theory. Thank you very much. No, 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 not at all. We must sleep on the problem tonight. Mm. I shall be surprised if we do not hear fresh news from Brook Street in the morning. Watson. <clears throat> yeah, wake up, my dear fellow. Oh, what? Uh, what time is it? It's half past seven. I, I'm sorry to disturb oh. you, but you must get dressed at once. Oh, why? What's the matter? Yeah, the, uh, the Brook Street business. Dr. Trevelyan's brooms at the door. He sent us an urgent message. Some fresh news? Hmm. Dramatic, but ambiguous. Scrawled in pencil on a page in a notebook. Yeah, let's see for yourself. For God's sake, come at once and in a very shaky hand. Mm, he was hard put to it when he wrote that. I'm going down to send for a cab. Uh, can you be ready in five minutes? Damn it, Holmes. I've rung the bell twice. There's no one at home. Well, that's impossible. Trevelyan would hardly have sent for us. Uh, ah, yeah, someone's coming. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, thank you for responding to my message so promptly. Please, come in. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but I was upstairs in Blessington's rooms with the inspector. Inspector? You've summoned the police already? I had no alternative. This is a dreadful business. Blessington is dead. Good God. <whistles> Forgive me. I must confess, this has shaken me a good deal. Yes, no doubt. But with your permission, Doctor, I think we should go upstairs at once. Ah, Mr Holmes. I'm very glad to see you, sir. Good morning, Lanner. Watson, you remember Inspector Lanner? Yes, of course. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. You, you won't regard this as an intrusion, I hope? Not at all, sir. <laughs> if you'd care to take a look in the bedroom... Yes, thank you. Blessington. Poor devil. 
Yes, sir. Pretty grim, I'm afraid. All right, Jorkins, you can leave that now. We were just about to cut the body down, sir. But you'd better see it as it was when we arrived. Yeah. Everything's just as we found it. Still in his nightshirt. Hmm. He must have gone to bed unable to sleep and decided to put an end to himself. Well, that is the obvious conclusion, certainly. Yes. Uh, when was it discovered? Uh, Blessington had a cup of tea brought to him every morning. When the maid entered his apartment about seven, she discovered this. Yeah. He tied a rope to the hook in the ceiling where the centre lamp used to hang and jumped off the top of that box. The same strong box he showed us yesterday. Mm. Uh, have you heard of the events leading up to this affair, Inspector? I have heard something about them, yes, sir. Mm. Have you formed any opinion? Well, sir, judging by the expression on the face of the deceased, it was despair what drove him to it. Black despair and hopelessness. I'm sorry to contradict you, but I think not. Beg pardon, sir? It's not despair you see in that face, Inspector. It is terror. Sheer, stark terror. Well, sir, whatever you choose to call it, it's a horrifying sight, sure enough. Uh, <clears throat> you'll notice that the bed's been well slept in. Mm. I'd make a guess he killed himself around five in the morning. That's a popular time for suicides. Judging by... The rigidity of the muscles, I should say, has been dead approximately three hours. Hmm. Mm, that appears to confirm your estimate. Uh, tell me, Inspector, have you noticed anything at all peculiar about the state of this room? Oh, I wouldn't say peculiar, Mr. Holmes. We found four cigar stubs in the grate. The deceased appears to have been smoking heavily during the night. Mm. Have you got his cigar holder? Uh, no, sir. No sign of one. No, his cigar case, then? Oh, yes. That was on the dressing table. Here it is. Oh, good. Hmm, quite so. This is a Havana. Yes, the stubs you found are of a different kind, imported by the Dutch from their East Indian colonies. Yes, two of them were cut with a knife, two had the ends bitten off by a set of excellent teeth. Hmm. This is no suicide, Inspector. It's a deliberately planned and cold-blooded murder. Begging your pardon, sir, but I must disagree with you there. Oh? Why is that? Well, several reasons. For one, why should anyone murder a man in so clumsy and difficult a fashion as hanging? Well, that is what we have to find out. And another thing, how could a murderer have got in? Well, through the front door, I presume. Ah, oh, the front door was locked and bolted on the inside this morning. Well, then it must have been locked and bolted after the murderers left the house. Murderers? More than one? What makes you say that? I've seen the traces. Perhaps you'll allow me a few moments to investigate further, uh, and in the meantime, you might care to cut down that wretched object. Yeah, very good, sir. Well, Mr. Holmes, have you uh, come to any conclusions? Well, certainly. The main facts are perfectly plain. Tell me, Inspector, the piece of rope that was used, do you know where it came from? Yes, sir. It was cut from a coil we found beneath the bed. I can explain that. Uh, Blessington had a morbid fear of fire. He kept a rope close by so he could escape through the window in case of conflagration. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes. Your so-called murderers couldn't have known the gentleman would be so obliging. I mean, they wouldn't expect to find a rope all ready for their purpose, would they? Only if one of them had already seen it on an earlier visit. You mean the young Russian? Well, there can be no doubt who the criminals were. As I thought, three men were involved. The pair who masqueraded as the Olofskys and a third to whose identity I have no clue as yet. Three men ascended to this apartment some time after midnight. I verified that from the three sets of footprints on the stairs. Of course, Blessington kept his bedroom door locked, but they soon forced it open with the aid of a wire. You can see the scratches around the keyhole. Yes, sir, that's all very well. On entering the room, they proceeded to gag Blessington. He may have been asleep or too paralysed with terror to cry out. Then, I believe, there was some sort of discussion. It lasted for a long time. That was when those cigars were smoked. And it ended in their dragging Blessington from his bed and hanging him. That's all I can tell you at present. Beg pardon, Mr Holmes, but this is all conjecture. We're still no nearer finding out who these men were. Never fear, Inspector. We shall soon have that information. Dr Watson, mm. might I trouble you to do me a small service? Yes, anything I can do. I'd like you to go to Fleet Street and look up the files of the evening newspapers for the 13th of September last. Mm. Make a note of any burglaries that took place in the West End of London the previous night. Mm -hmm. And I suggest we all meet again this afternoon, shall we say, three o'clock. Certainly, where? You'll find me in Baker Street, which is where I'm proposing to go now. Uh, but, Holmes, what are you going to do? I shall try to apply some logic to this tangled chain of circumstances, and at the same time, 
I shall have some breakfast. Mm. Good morning. Yeah, you're splendidly punctual, gentlemen. You've all arrived together upon the hour. Come in, Trevelyan, Inspector Lanner. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Watson, my dear fellow, I hope your researches proved successful. No, I'm sorry, Holmes. Not to put too fine a point on it. I'm afraid I've drawn a blank. No, surely not. The fact is, there were no burglaries in the West End on the night in question. But that's impossible. Blessington told me himself. You're sure you didn't mistake the date? I'm quite certain of it. Well, there's no news of any burglaries that night. The only item of that sort concerned not burglars, but safe breakers. Bank robbers, to be precise. There was a bank robbery in the West End. No, the robbery had taken place a good many years earlier. Four of the safe breakers were caught and sentenced. One of them was hanged. The other three got 15 years apiece. And on the 13th of September, several years before they had served their full term, they were released from prison. The Worthington Bank Raid. I see you remember the case, Inspector. Do you recall the names of the criminals? Just a minute. Let's see. Cartwright was a ringleader. He was hanged. The others were Biddle, Haywood, Almeida and Sutton. Now, Sutton turned Queen's evidence and it was on his testimony that the rest were convicted. Oh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, if you care to take Dr Trevelyan with you to Scotland Yard, I think he will be able to identify photographs of the men. Two of them as the bogus Russians and a third as the informer Sutton, better known to us as Mr Alfred Blessington. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. Oh, uh, Trevelyan. It's a chilly night. Come and sit by the fire. You're very kind. Oh, forgive me for imposing upon you yet again, Mr. Holmes. No, no, not at all. I was hoping you might return to tell us how you fared at the yard. Uh, you were right, of course. Sutton was Blessington. Hmm. Biddlen and Hayward were the other two. Yes. I recognise their pictures. But the other man, Almeida, was a stranger to me. Yes, but where are they now? That's what I want to know. Lying low, I suppose. The inspector seems pretty confident he'll run them to earth before long. I hope so, indeed. There's <sighs> three intruders, and yet... Lana told us the front door of your house was locked and bolted from the inside after the villains left. That means there must have been someone else, a confederate within the house. I don't see how that could be possible. Unless... Yeah, perhaps I might interrupt you there. I noticed that when we arrived at Brook Street this morning, you opened the front door to us yourself. So I did. Our Spanish maid, Maria, was in such a state of hysteria after discovering the body... She took to her heels and hasn't been seen since. And I think you mentioned that she hadn't been with you very long. Uh, uh, Spanish, you say, or could she have been Portuguese? Possibly. Spanish, Portuguese, what difference does it make? Well, only that Almeida is a Portuguese name. Hmm? Well, don't you see? Huh? She must have been the, the contact in the house, the link with the other man. How do you mean, the link? Well, I, I don't know. Wife, sister, fiancé. And now I come to think of it, at this very moment... Oh, yeah, Watson, huh? Watson, having the times there. Um, uh, yes? Uh, yes? Yes, look up the, uh, today's sailings and the European shipping lines. Oh, navigational news, sh shipping lines... Ah, oh, yes, here we are. Very good. Uh, was there a ship bound for Lisbon today? Uh, Lisbon. From Tilbury, the SS Nora Craner, ah. sailing at 11 p.m. tonight. Come, time is short. We must call a cab at once. Watson, have you sufficient light to read your watch? Yes. Ten minutes to eleven. And we're approaching the entrance to the docks. We should be there in time. Pray God that we are. It was a devilish plot. Three men determined upon revenge. Twice they tried to get at the traitor and failed. The third time they succeeded. So, all that talk about burglary was just a blind. Ah, small wonder he should have been thrown into such a state of terror when he read in the paper that his cronies had been set free. The men he betrayed at large and bent on vengeance. But when he asked for your help, why didn't he tell you the truth? Well, his secret was a shameful one. He dared not disclose it. Now we know the reason for that long discussion around his bed. The three men were holding their own judicial court, prosecuting him and condemning him to death. No doubt they looked upon it as a form of rough justice. Ah, here we are. We must go directly to the shipping office. Watson, are you there? Over here, Holmes. Well, sir, have the men been apprehended? What's the matter? We were too late. But there was an exceptionally high tide this evening, and the Nora Craner sailed 15 minutes early. By this time, she'll be heading for the open sea. A column message be sent to Lisbon, instructing the local police to pick them up on arrival. Now, these things take time, Doctor. International bureaucracy, like the mills of God, grinds very slowly. Now, I fear that the murderers have slipped through our hands.
Something interesting in the morning paper, Holmes? Hmm. I thought as much. You seem to be particularly absorbed. Yes. Uh, you remember the um, the Brook Street mystery a few weeks ago? Mm, I remember it very well. Yes, and have you considered adding it to your chronicles? No. Uh, why not? It didn't seem worthwhile. After all, your part in it was hardly accentuated by the fact that the murderers got away. Really? Hmm. What makes you ask? No, yeah, there's a, a short paragraph in the Times which might interest you. Yes, it concerns the men who escaped. Uh, they were caught after all? No, it's not that. It's a, uh, a brief announcement. Have a look. The wreckage has been found of the ill-fated steamer Nora Craner, which was recently reported missing. She must now be presumed to have gone down with all hands off the Portuguese coast, some leagues to the north of Oporto. There were no survivors. Rough justice, Watson. Rough justice. In The Resident Patient, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. With Robert Lang as Alfred Blessington, Clarence Smith as Dr. Trevelyan, David Kossoff as Count Orlovsky, George Winter as Stefan Orlovsky, Eric Allen as Inspector Lanner, Ajoa Ando as Maria the Maid, and Cyril Jenkins as the Lady of the Night. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Resident Patient was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>